The first seven minutes. Designing an overdose prevention protocol for your agency. A lot of agencies, they're very busy places, uh, whether they're drop-ins or whether they're uh, uh, providing a direct service. So whether it's, uh, they could be very busy with uh, other other people in the uh, the lobby or the clinical area. Um, so often um, there's a lot of confusion and chaos and uh, fear about uh, about this, this situation. Um, and in addition to this. Nobody knows what, there's no order, and nobody knows who should be doing what. Start the discussion. Every workplace has a fire plan, and drills are held regularly so everyone knows what to do in the event of a fire. If your agency is providing services to marginalized people, you should have a similar plan to deal with overdoses. Just like with fire, the plan needs to be well designed people need to be trained, and regular drills should be carried out. This video has been produced to help your agency create an overdose protocol that is unique to your agency. It will be most helpful if you can include board members, staff, clients, and volunteers in the process. This video will give you points to consider, including times when your clients are more vulnerable to an overdose and the value of running drills to be prepared. This video is not intended to provide you with answers, but rather to help guide you through the process of creating an overdose prevention protocol that is unique to your agency. In the few short minutes before emergency services arrive, what you do may save a life. Is your agency prepared for the first seven minutes? Identify risk factors. It is important to do a walk-around survey of your agency. The group doing the survey should include clients and any staff who have had to deal with an overdose in the past. Identify quiet corners, washrooms, alleyways, etc., where clients may use and are at risk if they overdose. Bathrooms uh, typically are uh, it's, it, it's, uh, the most, one of the most common places for um, uh, people who are homeless or marginalized to use. Uh, they're warm. They're private, and uh, you can run the tap when you're uh, when you're using, so nobody can hear what you're doing. Um, it it um, in a, in a, in a small cramped bathroom, it's not a good place for somebody to overdose because they can fall and hit their head on porcelain. Um, the door is locked from the inside, 99% um, of the time. So um, my experience as a paramedic is we were we were kicking in a lot of doors with the patient right behind the door. So. Most of the overdose risk factors your clients face won't be about physical space. Check days, bouts of depression, new medications, histories of overdose can all increase the risk for an overdose. One of the greatest risks is when people start using again after a period of abstinence, including jail time or hospital stays. Every new drug on the street, or a change in dealers, or the quality of drugs, all can put people at risk. Your best defense is a close rapport with your clients. Discuss how you can give your clients permission to share this type of information without any negative repercussions. It may save lives. Create a plan. You should have a, a fairly, a fairly highly structured plan around who does what, who's going to be calling 911, who's trained in CPR and first aid, um, who is big enough to lift somebody or carry them out of a washroom, say, for instance, if they're uh, trapped in a washroom. The plan you create should be unique to your agency, your staff, and the clients you serve. Every agency has different strengths. Every staff group has different skills and every client group has different risk factors. Make sure to address as many of the identified risk factors as possible. As with fire, you need to plan your response to an overdose before it happens. What communication systems do you have in place? Walkie-talkies, panic buttons, intercom, telephones? Make sure you can communicate an emergency from any part of the building as well as the surrounding area. Who will call 911? 
What will you say to the operator? Who will be in charge at the scene? Of course, along with calling 911, um, because we have a tiered response uh, plan here in Toronto and, uh, and in many places in uh, Ontario, um, police, fire, and ambulance do respond to uh, um, many, um, not all, uh, medical emergencies. Uh, often we, we need police for access and for uh, to keep the scene safe. But um, a lot of the time, they're not needed, and they, they can be cancelled and seen by the paramedics. Um, but once police arrive, sometimes the um, the tone and the, um, the the setting becomes a little uh, tense. Uh, people are fearful of the police, um, and uh, many many of the people many of the people the drug using community have. Uh, been in the criminal justice system, and uh, their experiences have been quite negative when it comes to uh, the police and incarceration. So, um, in order to um, to um, provide these people with some safety and some confidence, um, and you can give them some direction that uh, 911 is being called, and if you don't need to be in the facility, certainly it's best you leave um, at this time. Prevention is the best policy. If you have people sleeping in your agency, when do you check them for responsiveness? Where is the first aid kit? Is it complete? And who is trained in CPR? Consider stocking naloxone for staff to administer. This is a first aid kit, which is supposed to be accessible at all needle exchange programs. And I'm just going to go through the kit. Um, it's supposed to be in a location where all staff um, are able to access it and also where all staff are trained in how to use it. So the first thing we have in here is an emergency record and incident sheet. So the purpose of the emergency record and incident sheet is if someone was to go down or if someone was to be feeling dizzy, fainting, unconscious, redness, all of this stuff, it's all on here. You would fill it out accordingly and then you would submit it to management and if they were to go, like if they had to be transported to the hospital, this would go with them, this would go in their chart, etc. The next thing we have in here is a pocket mask, and that's for CPR. This is supposed to be sterilized after, the C after CPR has been done, after it's been used, and then put back. We have gloves in here, so if you were to come in contact with any sort of like bodily fluids, blood, saliva, anything like that, you'd want to be wearing, you'd want to be wearing gloves. Then we have a blood pressure cuff and a stethoscope to check the person's blood pressure, check their chest the respirations, that kind of stuff. Um, we have scissors in here. If you were using a defibrillator, you'd want to cut off their clothing to, to be able to put the patches on. So that's why we have scissors in here. We also have in here naloxone and epinephrine. The epinephrine is for when someone has an allergic reaction, whereas the naloxone would be for if someone was to um, have a drug overdose. We have syringes in here, which are used to administer the naloxone and the epinephrine. Whatever rules you create, they should be rational and able to be easily explained to your clients. Some agencies have made it a policy to only hand out safe use equipment as clients leave the building. Some don't let people take new works with them to the washrooms. Supporting a client during an overdose situation can be traumatizing. Make sure to spend time as a staff team to talk about your feelings and levels of stress afterwards. This would be a good time to review your overdose protocol and how well it worked. Train staff, clients, and volunteers. Create a list of what training is needed. Consider training clients as well as staff and volunteers. Clients are frequently the first people to witness an overdose, whether within your agency or in the surrounding area. Most people don't go into service agencies, get high and OD. It's often away from the agency. It's often in uh, uh, isolated or uh, remote settings. Um, so it's important for, for peers. World playing an overdose and other emergency scenes can feel artificial and awkward but better to feel awkward before you need to save a life. You can learn a lot from practicing ahead of time. Once you have a plan, remember to drill, drill, drill. Designing an overdose prevention protocol for your agency.
Start the discussion. Identify risk factors. Create a plan. Train staff, clients, and volunteers. 